night has fallen When fear is coming Still you're calling me When faith is lost and My hope exhausted You will be my strength When my mind says I'm not good enough God, you're enough for me I've decided I'm not giving up She won't give up on me You won't give up on me Presence. 
First Step means so much to me. It was the first thing that I did when I came to this church, and it immediately put me into the community. So instead of being in this great big building, instead it made it nice and small and personal and allowed me to really just connect and understand what the church really does and to just go ahead and know, what, what do I do next? Where do I go from here? And how can I really feel a part of this church and have an impact? Our First Step community is awesome. We don't always see each other every weekend, you know, for every experience. But when we do have First Step, it's like everybody comes together with hugs and love and just getting focused and ready to do what we do best. And that's welcome the family who is brand new, show them about Jesus, who he is, and teach them how to love him. What does the community of First Step mean to me? Well, just that word in their community, because that's what Jesus wants us to do, is build a community, because we weren't meant to do this alone. Like it says in Psalm 133.1, how good and pleasant it is for when God's people live together in unity. It's a place where me and my entire family, we can just come and, and serve together and, and just be together and just do things kind of as a family, but also in different areas. So that community for me um, is something that we belong to. It taught me a lot. It started from the basics of the Bible, of Jesus, of giving, of the purpose of giving, of um, Christianity. It gave me all of the basics. And you know, me having grown up in a Christian home, um, I'd learned a lot of those things, but actually going through First Up allowed me to start putting those things into practice and really making it come alive. And that was really exciting. Everybody was welcomed. Didn't matter where you came from, it was okay to not be okay. Yeah, some who haven't experienced First Step may think that it's just what some call Christian light, where for me now, I get fed daily on the Word, I get daily devotions, I get daily Bible studies that Central offers. First Step was good at teaching me how to meet new friends and new people. Being a person who has been shy all their lives, First Step was able to help me sort of bloom. I've met some wonderful people from not only attending First Step, but being a table host. My takeaway from First Step is the unity and knowing that we don't have to walk this journey alone. It's like we have a whole community to walk with. If you're having a problem somewhere, you can grab this person. I need help. You're having a problem over here, you can grab this person. I need help. Well, come on, let's work it together. And that's the community. That's the beauty of it, the whole thing. I believe we're all created with a purpose. And I don't think God created people to be spectators. I would encourage people to get into the game. Get into the game, come to First Step, learn what Central's all about, learn what maybe your talents are. And from there, you can decide what you want to do with it. God wants us to have a daily walk with Him, and First Step creates an opportunity to show you how to have the daily walk with Him. Come on, church. If you'd like to register for next week's First Step, just go to central.family. We'll look forward to seeing you back next Saturday. Hey, you know, the Bible makes it really clear that if you love God, you love others, right? In fact, Jesus said by this, all men will know that you're my disciples by the love that you have one for another. There's a verse found in 1 John, I believe it's uh, found in uh, 1 John 4, 8, where it says, but anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And when you think about it, we give to the things that we love. Any dog lovers in the room? Oh yeah, any cat lovers? Why? Our family, we've been dog lovers and we, we just love dogs. And, you know, growing up, we, we've had lots and lots of uh, little puppies and dogs in our family. And there was one time we had a dog that got real sick and the family was real upset. And I came home and they were crying and he wasn't doing good. So we rushed him off to the vet. We're all in that examine room and the vet comes in and examines the dog and says, let me go check out these x-rays and I can tell you whether we can save the dog or not. And everybody's crying in the exam room, Dad, please, please don't let the dog die. 
Now, I don't know if you've ever been in this moment, but I had a limited amount of love because I'm thinking in my head, as long as the cost of saving this little puppy is under this amount, he lives. (laughs) And if it's more than that, we're all going to say goodbye to little Jag today, okay? And wish him into heaven. The vet came back in and said his number, that what he could do to save the dog and to Jag's best day of his life. It was under my number and he lived, okay? It was a moment. And the family was happy. But you think about that. Think of it was one of my kids or one of my grandkids. Do you think I have a number in my mind? No. I'd be like, take it all. Take my house, take my car, take my savings. I'll live underneath a bridge because when it comes to those that you love, you'd give it all, right? And that's the way God is with us. He gave it all. He didn't hold back. He gave his one and only son. And the Bible says that when you and I love God, we give our all back to him. Are you with me, church? That's what he expects. That's all of our time, all of our talent, and our financial resources. We put him first. We make him the priority of our life. And it's easy to get involved financially. I want to encourage you to take that step. It's a step of faith. I realize that. There's a category in our church that we call generosity rock star. What's a generosity rock star? It's simply someone who signs up to join the online giving team. You say, I'll give at least $20 a week online. And you're taking a step of faith. Now, the number's not that important. Okay, maybe for you that's a dollar or five dollars or even ten dollars. But what's important is that you activate this area of your life so you can watch God show up and begin to transform you from the inside out. And when you do, we'll be right there to celebrate you. Our team would love to help you take that next step today. You can find one of them wearing a red apron in the lobby. Or you can go online at central.family or centralchurch.online. And you can take that step. But for all of you that are rock stars and financial contributors, thank you. Thank you for giving hope. Thank you for being a rescue in people's lives. And thank you for allowing God to transform you into his likeness because you love and you give. Let's go to God in prayer. Would you join me? Jesus, we're so grateful that you first loved us. We don't have to guess about your love. You displayed it openly for all of us to see. You willingly laid down your life so we could have eternal life, that we could have abundant life. And so Father, today we pray that we would experience that abundant life by having you a part of our journey, part of our life. We move our hearts towards you, Jesus, and we want to lift you up in worship today. And you promise as we do that you'll draw us unto yourself. So we want to experience your presence today. Your love and your peace, your mercy and your joy in our lives. May we know even more as a result of drawing near you. And Jesus, I pray that you'd have our, your way in our life and that our response to anything that you ask of us today would be simply yes. We'll trust you and we'll follow you. For we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. I could walk through 
Last week, my daughter Lola turned 13. I officially am a father of a teenager, which is pretty crazy. I've really loved watching my kids and their personalities develop and them grow passion for hobbies and their own interests. In fact, my daughter, uh, about two years ago, took a liking to hockey. She's been playing almost every day. She just gets out on the ice. She's the only girl on an all boys team. And it's pretty. In fact, a couple months ago, she got her first penalty. I'm like, that's my girl right there. <laughs> you know, I love her faith. I love her confidence to get better every day. She's so driven to be the best person on the ice. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, now faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. And it gives us assurance about things that we cannot see. And maybe you're here today and you're hoping for God to do something in your life. And I believe he's going to do it. You just got to have faith. You've got to have confidence that he's going to come through and keep looking to him. I want to take a moment today and I want to pray for our church family. If you need prayer, no matter what you're going through, if I can just say a simple prayer of your life, would you just 
boldly slip your hand up in the air. And if you're next to somebody with their hand raised, I wanna encourage you to just stretch a hand out towards them. Let's just pray. Let's ask God to do what only he can do. Would you join me? God, we thank you so much for being a faithful and a good God, for loving us in spite of our sin, in spite of our shame, in spite of our weaknesses. I pray that your Holy Spirit would meet us here today. God, that you would fill us with your love and your goodness. Thank you for being a father to the fatherless and a hope to the hopeless. For it's in your name we pray and everybody said together.
today. And would you please give up for our incredible Lori Wilhite. Hello, I love getting to worship with you. How good is our God, right? How good is He? Listen, have you ever done something and then you thought, was that useless? Did that make an impact at all? Did that make a difference? I feel like that pretty often. And that's why I love this verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. And it says, so my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. Always work enthusiastically for the Lord, for you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. Ladies in the room, here's what that means for you. When you lead in your home, when you do it for the Lord, it is never useless. When you lead in your workplace, when you do it for the Lord, it is never useless. When you volunteer here around the church and help lead here, when you do it for the Lord, it's never useless. And because of that, we can be strong and immovable, strong in our faith, strong in our families, strong in our relationships, strong in our purpose, and we can be stronger women. That's why I'm so excited to be able to invite you to our Leading and Loving It retreat for women that we have every single year here in Vegas at the Henderson campus. It's coming up October 25th and 26th. And we'll be joined by women leaders from all around the country who are flying in and from all people all around the world who will be joining us online. And as much as I love that, it would break my heart if we miss the opportunity to encourage you in your faith and help you become stronger as a woman. And so I wanna make sure you have the opportunity to come and join us. So you can do that in two ways. You can come and be here in person at the Henderson campus on the 25th and 26th. But if you're working and can't be there in person, you can join us online. You can live stream it or you can watch on demand for an entire year. And when you go to central.family and you can get registered there, you can use the central family discount code that is the word STRONG in all caps. But we don't let money hold us back from what God wants from us in our lives, right? And so I had a really generous donor who came alongside and gave me money for scholarships. And if you would like to come, which I hope you will, and you need a little bit of help, all you have to do is come and find me out in the lobby after this experience or reach out to my team and we would love to help get you there. So really there's no excuses. You can be here in person, you can be online, you can pay a discounted price, you can come for a scholarship, but here's the point. I would love for you to join me because I believe God is gonna do amazing work in those two days and make you stronger. Now we wanna give a shout out to all of our locations. Thank you so much for joining us, including the Sunrise Mountain location and all of the men and women joining us in prisons around the country with our partnership with God Behind Bars in the Pando app. We love you, we're praying for you, and we are so glad that you're here. So now let's get our minds ready, our hearts ready, our ears ready to see what God has for us today in this message of hope. All right, thank you, Lori. Uh, appreciate that and excited for leading and loving it. Coming up right around the corner. Um, you know, we've been in a teaching series week two this week called The Good Old Days. And I just want to encourage you to think back to when you were a kid. What did you want to be when you grew up? What did you want to be when you grew up? They asked some kids this recently. The Lego organization did, and they did this big survey, and they found, you know, in the top five answers, a lot of them were things you might expect, things like, you know, I want to be a musician, or I want to be an athlete, I want to be uh, a teacher. But the number one thing kids today want to be, you ready? YouTuber. I want to be a YouTuber, man, because, bro, playing video games on screen for your living, I mean, what gets better than that? Doing makeup tutorials for the girls, you know, what's better than that? Like, they want to be a YouTuber. And when I was growing up, it's a different world. I wanted to be a garbage truck driver. 
No lie. I see the garbage truck come down the street, banging, picking up those trash cans and dumping them in and then going to the next one. I just stand at the glass and look out. I remember as a little kid and just be like, that's the coolest thing in the world. I want to do that. Then I wanted to be a Dallas Cowboy football player for, for a little while. That didn't work out. Um, I thought for a while I, I, I would be like a superhero. And uh, I remember one day I dressed up as Superman and uh, we had this uh, wood burning fireplace in our house. And so outside the house was this wood that was all stacked up. It was about five or six feet tall and a long kind of row. And, and I climbed up on top of all that. I had my cape on, I had all the things on. And I just knew if I believed it inten intensely enough, I could fly. And so I ran down the, the length of the wood that was all stacked and I jumped and I went straight into the ground, got a bloody nose, the whole thing. But I believed for a moment that I could fly and I learned real quick I couldn't. And I think that story captures a lot of our experience. When you're young, you tend to think anything's possible, right? Anything could happen. You could be whatever you, whoever you want to be. You could go wherever you want to go. You could do so many things. Right? But then as you get older, life happens. You know, you hit the ground hard. You get a bloody nose, so to speak. You realize that hurt. And pretty soon we go from I can to I can't. My wife Lori was telling me this past week, uh, she did a, a seminar for some of our adult learners in our Central Academy, and she said one of the precious ladies in the Academy wrote at the top of her paper, I don't remember if it was this term or last term, but she wrote at the top of the paper, I can't do this. And Lori got all over her. And she's like, that's not what we write at the top of our paper before we get started. We write, I can do this. Because you can do this. But that's just human, isn't it? Life beats you up, circumstances beat you up, things beat you up, and pretty soon you just start thinking, I can't, right, I can't. I can't ever get out of this debt. I can't ever get this addiction under control. I can't ever get our family dynamic healthy again. I can't ever get on a career path that I'll really enjoy. I can't ever be healthy and whole. I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. And I wanna challenge you today to go even further because when you go first from I can to I can't, take it further as a person of faith and you realize, but God can. And then even further you realize we can together. We can together. You don't have to go back to the good old days to believe that things are possible. You don't have to go back to that time in your childhood when everything seemed like it was wide open to again have hope that the future can be better than today. In fact, as a person of faith, you have every right to live there in your life. Listen to what Jesus says in Mark chapter 10, verse 27. I'm going to read this scripture on the side screens. When we get to the red word, say it real loud here with me. But Jesus, he's speaking about salvation. And this is what he says. He says, humanly speaking, it is impossible, but not with God. Everything is what? possible with God. Everything is possible with God. You serve the God of the possible. You serve a God who's filled with hope. You serve a God who has a future in his hands. You serve a God who's working and moving in your life, who wants to bless you and empower you to accomplish his purpose. That's the God you serve. And if you're a person of faith today, that means every day you have an opportunity and you have every right to be optimistic because of the God that you serve. Even when life feels impossible, nothing is impossible for God. So I wanna to talk to you today about how today can be the good old days. Today can be the good old days. And when it, when it comes to possibilities, we serve a God of the impossible. I want to give you three simple thoughts from Abraham's life that can empower us to move forward with a sense that things really are possible in our lives again. The first is this, to hear God's promises. To hear God's promises. Uh, hearing is a challenge, I think, today. I saw this on social media. thought it was pretty funny. Uh, check this out. This guy says, my three-year-old asked how long he had to wait until he could stop listening to me. <laughs> three, three years old. 
I told him he had to listen to me for the rest of his life. He looked me dead in the eyes and said, I'll listen to you for the rest of your life. <laughs> Toddlers are cold-blooded, man. <laughs> Three years old. <laughs> Good luck, bro. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times in my life there's that awkward moment of silence it happens when you know your spouse has been talking and they're waiting for you to respond and you have no idea what they said. It's the silence that wakes you up to like, oh wait, huh? And then you gotta like navigate, right? You know, you gotta try to figure it out from there. Hearing is a challenge. And I wonder if Abraham struggled with it because God comes to Abraham in the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 12. We're gonna be in Genesis 15, but he comes to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, gives him this incredible promise that he'll be the father of, uh, of the nation, that he will bless um, the world through him. He's basically blessed to be a blessing. It's this amazing promise. But then again, God comes back in Genesis 15 and reiterates to him the promise, almost like Abraham needed to hear it again. So check this out. Genesis chapter 15, one, it says, sometime later, the Lord spoke to Abram, Abraham, same guy, to Abram in a vision and said to him, do not be afraid, Abram, for I will protect you and your what? Reward will be great. It's like God comes back and he goes, hey, hey, Abram, check it out. Look, I'm going to reward you. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to bless you in your life. I believe with all my heart, look, I was raised, and I think a lot of us were kind of have this idea that, that God is like an angry police officer in the sense that he's just looking to give you a ticket. <laughs> right? Like, hey, you speeding? You know, like, like he, he's just waiting to give you a ticket. And it took me years of getting back into the Bible and reading the Bible and studying it to see a bigger picture of who God describes himself to be. I mean, in the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, the very first words that God speaks over people, it says he blessed them. He blessed them. The word bless is used more in the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, than any other book of the Bible. And it's used all through the Bible, but more in Genesis than anywhere. And I think part of the idea is God's like introducing himself as the God who loves to bless his people. He's not just trying to write a citation for doing something wrong over your life. He actually wants to bless and empower you to accomplish his purpose in your life. And so... God's reminding Abram, he not only rescues his people, he rewards his people. He rewards his people. And certainly there's a reward in the life to come in heaven, and God can also reward us in our lives today as we follow him in faith. My challenge to all of us, myself included, is to go back to the promises of God and to really hear them in your heart and life. If you've gotten to a place where your possible is greatly limited, and you start thinking nothing's really possible and you can't do anything, you gotta step back and realize that you have promises given to you by a God who is good and who loves you, who will be faithful to his word. In fact, let me just bring some, uh, some general promises up on the TV screen here. You know, a lot of us, maybe right now, are in our lives where we just feel like, hey, there, there won't be enough. There's fear related to finances, to um, what we need to survive, and we think there won't be enough. But God has promised, Matthew 6, I will provide, which means you get to wake up every morning with a sense that no matter what comes at you, you don't have to live in fear because God is a God who provides. That's his promise to you. Here's another thought. Some people think the future is ruined. Why do you think that? Because you've been watching the news. Anyway, <laughs> and that's how the news funds itself, right? So the future's ruined, but God's saying, look, my plans still stand. Listen, I want you to think about it. Nothing can ultimately alter the plan and purpose of God. Not Putin, not international politics, not global situations. Look, God says, my plans still stand. Here's a third thought. You say, I, I'm not safe. Maybe you're wrestling with like security right now and just in general in your life, I don't feel safe. God says, look, I'll be with you. It's the number one promise of the Bible, mentioned more often than any other because the greatest promise of God is his presence. And God says, look, no matter what you go through, no matter how hard it is, no matter how difficult it is, I will be with you. 
Maybe you're here today and maybe you say, look, I'm, I'm overwhelmed. Maybe you're, you're overwhelmed at work. Maybe you're overwhelmed at home. Uh, if you're a Dallas Cowboy fan, you're overwhelmed. <laughs> and God says, I will, <laughs> I will send my spirit. It won't help the Cowboys, but it, it, it can help you. Nothing can help the Cowboy, but it can help you in your life. His spirit can empower you and work in your life. If you're like me, I need to hear that again and again and again and again and again because I tend to like let it go in one ear and let, let it go out the other. And I just have to come back to the promises of God and remember, God will be true to his word. God will be faithful to his word over my life. I can get up in the morning with a sense of hope and optimism because I have the promises of my God at my back and because I know he goes before me and he goes behind me. That doesn't mean my life will be easy, but it means I'll never be alone no matter what I face. God will see me through. Look, your problems are real, they're scary, but your problems do not determine what's possible. Your problems do not determine what's possible. God's promises determine what's possible. Your problems are temporary. His promises are forever. Your problems, man, they're, they're, they're not really even in your control, but God is in control. And he may not show up on your schedule. He might not show up in a way that you expected or wanted. But listen, a broken dream doesn't mean that God has broken his promise. It just means that his best is still on the way. He's out to bless you so you don't have to fear the worst. You can believe the best and you can look to the future with a sense of hope and possibility. You don't have to be a kid to do that because you're a person of faith. So here is promises. Let them sink in. Here's another thought and that is to share your dream. You know, kids are good at like stating what their dreams are and being verbal about those dreams. In fact, uh, check this out. They asked uh, one kid this, these three questions. What are three things you want to do in the future? He says, number one, get a girlfriend. Number two, kiss her. Number three, rule the world. It's like every guy's dream right there. It's like, yeah. All right, let's go to the next one. This kid, uh, he says, my one wish is for it to rain tacos. I got to think it was about lunchtime when they did this in school, right? He's like, man, I'm starving. All right, one more. He says, this is what I, when I grow up, I'd like to be a veterinarian, a baseball player, a chef, but, but I love Albert at the bottom, a person who stays home and does nothing. How many of you are feeling Albert right now? Give me some Albert life. Yeah. Stay home and do nothing. That'd be awesome. Abraham had a dream. He had a dream. And his dream was to have a son. It was what he really wanted more than anything else in his life. And in that culture, it was different than our culture. It's a whole different time, whole different era. In that culture, having a child, having a son was everything because that meant your name would continue, your legacy would continue. Like without a son in that culture, you were nothing. And Abraham, despite his wealth, despite his accomplishments, despite all the things that had happened, the one thing that he really wanted, God had not given him. And God had alluded to it and promised it to him in Genesis earlier. But again, it still hadn't happened. And so God comes to him and says, listen, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to reward you. But it's been years and nothing's happened. Somebody's like, that's my life. And, and then we get to Genesis 15, the very next sentence. Look at how Abraham responds to God in this moment. But Abraham replied. God says, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to reward you. Abraham replied, oh, sovereign Lord. Check it out. What good are all your blessings when I don't even have a what? Son. I mean, that's honest. Abraham's like, great, you're going to bless me. But I don't even have a son. And God doesn't get angry with him. He doesn't get upset with him. Look at what it says. It says, then the Lord took him outside and said to him, look up into the sky and count the stars if you can. That's how many descendants you will have. And Abram believed the Lord and the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. Now that last sentence right there is a very important sentence in the arc of the Bible. 
Um, it's the first time we see this incredible statement that the righteous will live by faith. Paul will pick this statement up in the book of Romans in the New Testament, and he'll basically apply it over our lives to our belief and faith in Jesus, that as we believe and trust in Jesus, that is what declares us righteous, that the righteous will live by faith. But in Abraham, you see in the Old Testament, look, he believed what God was telling him, the promises of God, and therefore it was credited to him as righteousness. And so Abraham had a dream, and he shared that dream. Have you ever shared with God in conversation and prayer the dream that you have on your heart and in your life? Have you ever spoken it out loud? It's not that God's a Aladdin. <laughs> it's my dream, God. I want to be, you know, a rock star. <laughs> then it just happens. Cool. Some people kind of treat God that way, you know? I mean, that's sort of their, you know, they're rolling the dice like, all right, all right, God. You know, put it on seven, whatever. <laughs> it's not that God is beholden to us. We're beholden to him. But it is okay to share the dreams and the passions that God has put in your heart and life with him. Because what it does is it starts a conversation. It starts a moment. And Abraham is honest. Look, this is, this is the thing in my heart. I want a son. And he shares it with God, frankly. And God doesn't, he's not offended by that. And in this case, God gives him a son. I think a lot of times when we think about God, I'm going to bring a slide up on the screen. I think early on in our faith journey, sometimes, you know, we kind of have this perspective. We have a dream and we want God to like come along into our dream, right? You know, like, God, this is what I want to do with my life. And then if you'll just bless it, that'd be awesome. <laughs> you know, like, like just come along and make it happen. Great. But I think as you grow in your faith, you realize there's a bigger picture here and it, and it looks more like this. God has a dream. Hello. And my dream needs to align with and fit into his dream for the world. What is God's dream? Well, God's dream is that we basically know him and glorify him forever. That's the dream. That the world was created, that you and I were created, that we are here because of God, by his will, for his purpose. That the world is primarily about him right? Which is first pages of the Bible. In the beginning, who? God. Not in the beginning, you. Not in the beginning, me. Right? In the beginning, God. What's the Bible trying to tell us? Welcome to his world, his purpose, his plan. You don't like it? It's not your world, his world, his purpose, his plan. You got issues? Fine. It's his purpose, his plan, his world. And we're now in his world. But within that, God puts things in our hearts. You have dreams, things that you want to do, things that you want to accomplish, and that is okay. In fact, I, would, I, I love this book by Oz Guinness called The Call. This was a powerful book for me because Oz Guinness breaks down that, that when he looks at the Bible and he did this exhaustive biblical study, he says, look, we, we don't have one specific calling in our lives. We actually have three. And he said, the first calling is what we might call our primary calling. As a person of faith, he says, our primary calling is to believe in Jesus and trust him in our life. That's it. John chapter 6, Jesus basically says, this is the only work God wants from you, to believe in the one who he has sent. Primary calling is to believe in Jesus and trust in him. And so we share the primary calling. Then, he, then Guinness says in the Bible, there's a secondary calling. The secondary calling is, is general. It's to use your gifts, talents, and resources to serve God by serving others. Right? To use your gifts, talents, and resources to serve God by serving others. And I think when it comes to, to that whole kind of area in our life, the church has really done a disservice in people's lives over the centuries. The church centuries ago made this distinction and they said, listen, there's a thing called the perfect life. And if you want to have the perfect life, the only way you can really have the perfect life is you have to do this kind of perfect work. You have to be a nun, a monk, or a priest. Sounds exciting, doesn't it? 
If you're a non a monk or a priest, you have a perfect life. But everything else is in a category they call the permitted life. Okay, it's permitted. You can be a farmer, you know, whatever, if you want to shoot low. <laughs> you can be a carpenter. You can be a tradesperson. You know, you can be a, a teacher. You can be pretty much anything other than a monk, a nun, or a priest. And the idea became, look, this is sacred work over here, church work. And then this is secular work over here, everything else. This is the perfect life and this is the permitted life. And it created this distinction that you do not see in the Bible. When you study the Bible, God calls us to all kinds of tasks, to holy special work that may be carpentry or farming or agriculture or teaching or being a police officer, or a first responder, or a fireman or working in sales or helping people get kind of their needs met from a living standpoint, working in, re in, uh, in um, uh, uh, the whole home sales area. Look, there's, it's a big net. All of it can be sacred work because you're using your time, your talent, and your resources to serve God by serving others. So I just want to empower you because I think a lot of times we're waiting around and we're like, I, I really don't know what God wants me to do. So between not knowing and kind of where I'm at, I'm just going to take a job. And it may actually be that, that taking whatever job you take is you can do exactly what God wants you to do because he wants you to leverage your time, your talent, and your resources to serve him by serving others. That doesn't mean you show up and preach at people. That doesn't mean you become that guy at work that's like, hey man, God bless you. Yeah, man, nice to see you. But you know, like you don't have to be that guy. You don't even have to talk about God because you're living it out. And when you think about it, no matter what you do, a lot of the sacred nature of your life is going to come between the specific job tasks in how you treat other people, right? Just how you live your life. And then God can open doors for those spiritual conversations and God can make a way, but you just be faithful, living your life, doing what God has put in your heart. I think a lot of times we sit at the light and we think the light is red and we're praying, God, man, turn the light green, turn the light green. You know, I want to open this thing. I want to start this business. I want to do this thing. God, turn the light green. And I, I just want to encourage you that maybe the light is green and God's like, why are you sitting there? You're going to get rear ended. And, and maybe a better approach is to say, all right, God, I'm going to believe. I understand your dream for the world, and I understand you've put this in my heart. This is a passion and a desire of mine, and I'm going to serve you with all that I have, but I'm going to go after this dream, and I'm going to believe the light's green, and I'm going to pray you don't let me stop me before I hit somebody, okay? Here we go. And we just, we step into it. A lot of times we're waiting for God to give us what we might call the third area, the special calling. God, give me this special calling. I think our egos sometimes just feel like, man, we have to have this super unique special calling from God to do anything, you know, like, you know, but what's interesting that Oz Guinness points out, so powerful for me, he says, really look at, of all the people that live through history, the, the times the Bible covers, he says, very few of them actually received a special calling, very few. You think about the Old Testament prophets, <laughs> you don't want that calling. <laughs> and that special calling almost always is to do a specific task for a specific amount of time. And that special calling almost exclusively is to call other people to the primary calling, love God and serve him, and to the secondary calling, use your gifts and talents and resources to serve others and bring glory to God. So I just think sometimes we get paralyzed in this whole area. And the reason I think it's important is this. When you sit back and think, what is it that, that I would really love to do? If you give yourself permission to start dreaming again, I want you to think that God has been writing a story in your life, your whole life. He's put things in your heart. And it's not like you just have to drop those things because now you believe in Jesus. Actually, I think God's been writing that stuff in your life and in your heart your whole life. 
And whether it's art or music or teaching or serving others or sales or craftsmanship or construction or photography or video, like whatever God has put in your heart, that can be a holy endeavor. That can be a sacred work. It's just as sacred as what I'm doing right now. I'm just doing my calling. What God put in my heart. What I can't not do, people ask, how do I know if I'm called into ministry? I'm like, can you do anything else with your life? If you can do anything else with your life, you should do it. But when you're so compelled that you realize that there's nothing else I can do, like God just keeps shutting every door, bringing me back here, then you're ready for a life of ministry. That's how you stay in forever. Um, But your calling is just as valid as my calling. So share it with God, share your dream, share your calling. And then here's the third idea, and that is to look up and look out. Abraham comes back to God and, and uh, in the midst of this conversation, and he wants assurance, right? He speaks, I don't even have a son. God says, look up at the sky. He says, how do I know? Check this out, Genesis chapter 15. But Abraham replied, oh, sovereign Lord, how can I be what? sure that I will actually possess it. He's like, all right, you know, I'm gonna, we're gonna have you know, descendants, we're gonna have land, great. How can I be sure? You ever felt that way? How can I really know? And God basically does something fascinating in the book of Genesis. He he sets a covenant with Abraham, which is an ancient version of a, it's more than an agreement. It's like the most binding agreement you can have. And God says, look, you can know because I'm making this covenant based on my own faithfulness. And then it transfers over into the New Testament, this whole imagery, because when Jesus died on the cross, he died and made a new covenant with us. So how can we trust God's promise? How can we hang on to it? The Bible's gonna point us to Jesus and say, because of what Jesus did for us, that's where we get our assurance. That's how we can know. Listen, because Jesus walked the earth, God will walk with you. Because Jesus shared the truth, you and I can know the way. Because Jesus was hated and rejected by people, you can be loved and accepted by God. Because Jesus was born, you can be born again. Because Jesus was wounded, you can be healed. Because Jesus was abandoned, you can never be alone alone in your life because Jesus was given a punishment he didn't deserve. You get a reward that you could never deserve. Listen, because Jesus never sinned, your sins are wiped clean. Because Jesus gave up his life, he can give you new life. Because Jesus is your protector, no weapon formed against you will prosper. Because Jesus is your savior, the doors of heaven are wide open to you. Because he rose up, you can rise up. And so if you're a follower of Jesus today and the cloud that hangs over your life is one of I can't, it's impossible. I want to challenge you because it may be like me that you've allowed your lack of faith to lead you into a corner. And that corner is filled with your limitations, your childhood, your perspective. The Bible has a word. It's called repent. And the word repent literally means to turn around. And maybe if you're in that corner today, it's time to turn around and to say, God, I'm sorry, I've limited you. God, I'm sorry, I've reduced you. I'm sorry that I've chosen to view you through my own failures and faults and mistakes. And God, I'm willing to come back and say, okay, I'll hear your promise. I'll let it sink into my heart. I'll meditate on it until it takes root in my life. And God, I will, as I follow you, I will share my dream. I'll share it with you. I'll share it with others, what you've put in my heart and life. And I'm gonna realize that I can go after my dream and align it with your dream because you've put these things in my heart. And then I'm gonna look up and look out and look to Jesus. That's my assurance that no matter what happens, God, you will watch my back. You'll go ahead of me and you'll go behind me. You don't have to be a kid to believe that things are possible. You just have to have faith. And as a follower of Jesus, you have every right to have faith that things are possible, that the future can be a future filled with goodness and filled with God that God loves to bless his people and he can bless you and your family as you follow him faithfully. 
maybe you're here today and maybe you've never crossed that line of faith, I'd love to give you that opportunity to place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, to just acknowledge you're willing to follow him and to start, start your spiritual journey. So I want to ask all of you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And if you'd like to take that spiritual step today, you can begin by just repeating a simple prayer after me. It's not the end of your spiritual journey. It's just the beginning. You say this out loud or in your own heart. This is a way to take a step spiritually. I would just say, dear God, I thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus into the world. I believe he died on the cross for my sins. I believe he rose again. Forgive me for my sins. Give me the gift of eternal life. Help me face the challenges that I'm up against. God, I surrender my life to you in Christ's name. Friends, with every head bowed and every eye closed, if that's your prayer today, if it's your commitment, I want to ask you to just slip your hand in the air. Just make eye contact with me just to say before God, to say to me, you're going to follow him and trust him in your life today. God bless you guys. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you. Just reach out to him today. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God, we thank you for your love, and I thank you for each person just reaching out to you, and I pray you'll fill them with your spirit, your power, your goodness. Let them know they're not alone, and you're moving and working in their life. We give you thanks and praise today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's put our hands together for those who made spiritual commitments in their life. Why don't all of you stand together with me? If you stand together with me, if you made a spiritual commitment, we want to tell you congratulations. We'd love to see you in the lobby after service. We'll give you a journal called the Follow Him Journal. You can go online to uh, central.family and click I've Decided to Follow Jesus as well. Let us know you made a spiritual commitment. Let's put our hands together for Pastor Nick, who's got a few final thoughts. What an incredible weekend. And hey, if you made a decision today to follow Jesus, we want to celebrate with you. Just like Pastor Judd said, we have a gift for you and those that made that decision. So you can go to central.family and there is a guide on how to follow Jesus. It's an incredible resource, so make sure you go there. But don't forget to sign up for First Step. It's next weekend. It is the best way to get plugged in, just like Pastor Nick said, not just from viewing church online, but being a part of the Central family. And so before you go, let's hang on to Romans 8 this week. If God is for us, who can be against us? Bye guys.